Hey Flosstube, it's Kim aka Spurt and Stitcher on Instagram and I am back again with another weekly cross stitching update. Today is President's Day the 15th of February 2021. This is video number 108 and I worked on four different pieces this week so let's get to it. First one I pulled out Big Red Ship of Life by Ink Circles and I am on the third row now so we're we're working along here. I had already finished this page, uh, which cuts off right bef like right at the start of the arm of the second guy. So I started working on the second page of that row. Um, didn't have much motivation to work on this one. I uh, worked on it for three days and I got 1,700 stitches put in. So there you go. Mm. There is the entire piece so far. This is 28 count even weave, mushroom even weave by uh, MCG Textiles. Let me get you closer. So I did, this is the, the deck of the boat. So I did that all the way over. Um, again, this page was right on the start of the second guy. So I've done all of this, this guy up here, all of, and all of this. So it doesn't look like much. That is the, the end of the page. Um, but that was 1700 stitches. Uh, DMC 3808 on that one. 28 count, one over one. And then um, I had a new start for Kelly at Animal Instinct's 40th birthday, that her only 40 once sell. And I started this piece, uh, What a Gala by Crafty Like a Fox. Um, I keep forgetting what their Etsy shop is called. It's a little bit different. They do have their own website, craftylikeafox.com.au. Um, but they also have an Etsy shop. And I believe they only sell kits. This is a pattern that I got from Nicole at Buckeye Stitcher. And she sent me her leftover threads for me to either use or, or match my own. And what I'm going to do, since I'm making this to resemble two particular specific galas that um, I know, I'm changing the colors and I'm changing some of the design as well. So you can see in the model that their tails are this light gray with a little bit of pink down here. And they're both the same color, dark pink with other light pink accents. Well, the two galas that I'm making this uh, resemble our two different shades of pink and gray. And also a galaz tail is that light gray at the top, but then as you get into it, its feathers, it becomes that dark gray. So I changed it already. I've only got about 200 stitches into this. Uh, so this is the gala that is the dark gray and pink. So you can see um, I pretty, I used the, this gray is the one that was in the kit. But instead of the light gray uh, tail with the pink accents, I used the beginning of the tail, the feet are going to go in there, is the light gray, and then it moves to the dark gray with a little bit of the light gray accents instead of pink. Uh, so I will be making more changes to this. It means it's slower going as I change different aspects, aspects about the design. Because um, even though, like even in their bellies, there's two different shades of pink in this darker pink area um, that you can't really see that well before you get to the little V's uh, to create some some detail in there. So I'm kind of playing around with color, deciding what I want. It means it takes longer, but I think I'll be happier with the result. So there is my start using it on some uh, stretcher frame. And this is a 28 count piece of blue I don't know if it's Monaco or what, but uh, I just had this in my stash and I know it'll fit. Um, for the the branches around it, I'll probably have to take it off the stretcher frame to, to get all those stitches in. But at least for the birds, while I'm figuring out what I'm doing, I'm going to use the, the stretcher frame. And then for Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, this morning, I worked on a summer ball since I need to do a page and a half of this this year for my traditional goal. So I put in 2,000 more stitches on this one. 
and pretty much I'm just filling in from the bottom and moving up. So uh, before this I had almost all the flooring done and uh, like this much of her dress done in those white and pale blues. So I finished her dress up until where her arm is out and I did all of their uh, stockings and the first part of their uh, breeches and then there's a little bit of a pink dress here and then I started the yellow dress. So as well as bringing up his jacket and the rest of his shoe. So there is 2,000 more stitches into that one. I will backstitch all the details when I have the whole page done. So if you look, okay, if you want to see where I'm at, I'm just past the middle of the design. So here's the, the woman with a, a white, light, light blue dress. And here's the three gentlemen. I'll actually get to stitch the red coat. And then the ladies that I started. So that's where I'm at. Um, there will be a whole lot of background that'll be easy stitching uh, once I get up there. So that's 2,000 into that. And then my last piece that I worked on is my daily piece um, for my finish this year. Oh Baby by Gilgash Taylor. This is a retired haid. And I cropped it. Um, and last week I told you that I had 11 colors done out of the 83. Uh, this week I decided to uh, increase that number. So my goal as I was choosing colors, what, what colors to stitch, um, I was looking at the colors that had the fewest stitches left that were all in his muzzle and around his muzzle. So I could finish off as many colors as I could in this week. So I had 11 colors done. Now I have 35 colors done. So I did put in stitches all over. Um, but now I have 35 out of the 83 done. And I put in 2,710 stitches for a total of 20,310 stitches so far. So we are almost at halfway for the um, 21 and 21 challenge for full, full coverage fanatics. So you can see a whole lot more details around his muzzle. All the, the shading is pretty much where, um, where the background stops and his muzzle begins. I did a whole lot of that. I did a whole lot more here for his uh, face markings. And then down here, um, you can't really see it that well in the printout, but in the art, he's got whiskers. So this is where some of his whiskers will be, will be down here. And then the fence is this thick, but the second half of it is totally different shades, which I haven't gotten to yet. So that's why um, that hasn't filled in. I have filled in more of this background above the fence. So still working away at this. This is more than one page. This is like a page and a half uh, in width. And we'll do that before I move it over into the rest of it. There's a whole lot um, of big block stitching in his neck down here. So this, this part will take me a lot longer to do than this part. So that is where he's at. You can't see his eyes that, that well right now cause he's all covered up, but that's my, my baby. So plans for this week, keep working on Oh Baby of course. Um, I will go for the page finish another day or two to finish the page on Beauty and the Beast to fill all in the empty spaces here. Um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is the non-counting weekend event for Full Coverage Fanatics Big Strides. So working on your biggest piece. And I didn't bring over the picture, but if you've been watching me, you know my biggest piece is uh, Super Size Color Expansion Museum Shelf. So this is where it's starting and I'll get to work on this page right here. The, I think it's the, pretty much the last page of the dinosaurs on this row of pages. So uh, I'll get to work on that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I'll probably, I'll pull out another full coverage piece too. I'm, now that I've got all the, all the um, personal monthly goal rotation, uh, commitments done for the month. Now it's like, okay, now I get to enjoy and work on all the, all the full coverage pieces. 
um, try to go for more page finishes. So Beauty and the Beast will get the page finish on that. Uh, maybe more work on Sunday Delight, since I already um, have a good chunk of that page going, thanks to Bingo. Um, and then Museum Shelf and Oh Baby. We'll see, we'll see what else I get into. So those are my plans. Um, the only other stitching content I have is a potential spoiler. So if you have have uh, bought the Lost in Austin box by Black Needle Society and you haven't received it yet, I'm not going to show everything. I'm just going to show the specific stitching related items. So if you don't want to see what those are, then skip about a minute if you're still interested in the Air Force story. If not, uh, we'll see you next week. So there's a whole bunch of non-stitching related items, but I'll show you the the uh, three main stitching related items. There's always, I believe their boxes always come with a pattern that is specific to the box that is designed for that box. And this one has a uh, heartstring samplery called Really Friends. Uh, it's Catherine Moreland's sampler. And it says, there's nothing I would not do for those who are really my friends. So let's see if I can get it without the glare. So that is what the pattern looks like. And also came with a needle minder. And this is Obstinate Headstrong Girl. And it's got a silhouette of a Regency lady on there. Um, there was no fabric in the box. Other items, but it did come with some floss. Uh, let's see. The flosses are from Forbidden Fiber Company. And they're all named after Austin leading ladies. So you have uh, Emma's Good Intentions, Catherine's Gothic Inclinations. So these are approximately six yards, and it does say they are color fast. Fanny's Friendship is a variegated pink. These are all um, decently variegated, some of them more than others. Marianne's Broken Heart. Nice light blue. Anne's Constancy. It's a darker navy. And then Lizzie's Laughter is a very variegated lavender and purple. So those are the three main stitching items in the box. Um, the others, I'm sure somebody else out there has a video as unboxing showing everything else in the box. But it was, it was fun to get and fun to open and explore everything in there. So... Uh, life updates. I get my second COVID shot this week. My husband got his last week Wednesday and all he had was arm soreness. Um, some other my neighbors have gotten their second shot as well. And it's either, it's like a, a crapshoot. You don't, you either are hardly going to feel it or you're going to have flu symptoms for 24 hours, at least for the, the Pfizer shot. So we'll see what happens to me this week. That could affect my stitching. Maybe not. Um, the other thing that will be affecting my stitching for the next six weeks or so is that the Girl Scout cookie season has started. Uh, online sales started this past Friday a few days ago. And in-person sales start this upcoming Friday, starting with cookie booths. So I will be working at least one cookie booth every single weekend for the next few weekends with my oldest daughter. Um, so be it at the mall, at a grocery store off base, excuse me, at the shop at or commissary here on base, the, um, privatized housing company here on base is not letting us go door to door, uh, this year. Um, but it's been negative like 33, 40, negative 50 degrees, uh, Fahrenheit wind chill anyway. So we don't want to go door to door. Um, we can go door to door off base. So that will be taking away from my stitching time, but it's only like six, five, six, five or six weeks. Um, so, and what was the other thing I was going to mention? There was something else. I didn't write it down. Okay, hold on a second. Well, I don't remember what it was, so we're going to go straight to the Air Force story. So if you're not interested in that, thank you for joining me. We'll see you later. Um, Air Force story is more just general information here, and then I'll have some links below uh, where you can find some entertaining videos. 
Um, now, when you fly commercially and when you your plane is taxiing back into its parking spot when, after you, you've arrived at your destination, you know that there's someone guiding the, per, guiding the pilots into the parking spot as well as what we call wing walkers, people who are standing at the wings. They usually have a, a flashlight or a torch, if you will, with a, a, a cone over it so it lights up in the nighttime. And what the person guiding the pilots, uh, what they're doing, what is called, is called marshalling. So it's a, it's a safety thing. When you have no way to verbally communicate with the air crew, you need a way to visually communicate with the air crew uh, to keep everybody on the ramp safe. So in the Air Force or commercial airplanes, whenever the jets are moving, of course, the movement is controlled by the tower. The tower gives the, the pilots the clearance to taxi, um, or if commercial, they give the clearance to be pushed back and then taxi for their takeoff. Um, in the Air Force, the tower gives them, still gives them the clearance to taxi. They don't have to be pushed back or reversed, if you will, like commercial airplanes do. So <clears throat> after the engines start, while the engines are starting and, and pilots are doing all their flight checks, they are talking to one of their crew chiefs through a comm cord. So um, he's always connected. He's got his headset on, a, a sealed mouthpiece so that the engine noise um, doesn't interfere with being able to, to hear and communicate with each other. Uh, but then after they finish their flight checks and they're getting ready to, to you know, start taxing, they tell their crew chiefs, all right, we're cleared. You can, you can button up. So button up the, um, unplug the comm cord, button up that panel and start standing out front. So regardless of airframe, it takes two crew chiefs to launch an Air Force airplane because you always have, once you, once that verbal communication is uh, disconnected and you no longer can speak to them, you have your visual communication. And in order for that pilot to taxi, his chocks need to be pulled. So the chocks are the wooden blocks on either side of the wheels uh, that keep the aircraft from moving. Well, you don't want someone underneath the jet that they can't see or talk with. So that's why you always have the A-man is out front with visual communication with the air crew while the B-man is pulling chocks or pulling the last few pins. So the A-man stands out front standing at parade rest until the pilot tells them, all right, let's pull chocks. So that's your symbol for pull chocks. And your crew chief will, will say, we're pulling chocks and go up this. And this means hold the brakes, stop, don't move. So he's doing this while his B-man is going out and pulling the chocks. I do have a visual aid for this. Um, these are little mini chocks that were made as a table decoration for like a, a formal Air Force dinner. So little mini chocks, so going around the wheel, um, they're not usually connected. They have a rope um, and then there's usually a groove cut in here. So the rope with a knot can slip in here and the knot will keep the, the rope. Let's say that the plane starts moving forward. If it's really windy, um, that rope with a groove and the knot keeps it, keeps the chocks from pulling apart. And depending on your size of the airplane will dictate the size of your chocks. So these are just table decoration chocks that are really cute. Um, <clears throat> so they will pull chocks, pull chocks. This is chocks going in, chocks coming out. So if you ever see military people and they're at like a party or something and they're like, let's go, that's, that's visual communication that, you know, let's, let's get out of here. Um, so pulling chocks and then they'll be over their head like this while their B-man is going under the jet and pulling chocks. And then once it's clear, he'll still be like this waiting for the pilot or the air crew members to tell them that the tower has cleared them to move. So they're just standing, um, not directly in front of the jet, off to the side on the inside corner. So whichever way that jet is going to taxi, whichever way, it's like a one way street. Um, the taxiway is. So they're going to stand on that, that inside corner and wait for the air, air crew to um, tell them, all right, let's go. 
So the air crew gives them a, a signal that it's okay to go. The crew chief is going to look both ways, make sure the taxiway behind him is clear, and then start marshalling him to move forward. Now, a fighter crew chief can keep his signals much closer to his body and smaller because he's closer to the airplane. A large airplane crew chief, whether it's a bomber, a cargo, refueler, they're a ways away from, because that plane is going to turn in front of them. Versus a, a fighter crew chief, that plane is going to turn like around them and go behind them. So your, your big airplane crew chiefs usually will have the flashlights with the uh, colored cone on the top. Um, and the fighters will use those if they're doing nighttime ops because you can't really see your hands really well in the nighttime. Even though there is lights coming down on the ramp, they will use their uh, flashlights or torches because they have that plastic piece on them. So they'll be like, all right, it's time to go. This is start rolling forward. And then you're doing this. This is go forward. So again, fighters might do something like this because you're closer and you can see them. And the big airplane folks, they're doing this to make it easier to see. They're holding their, their flashlights. If you want to turn, you're going to point the direction that they're turning. Like this is not rocket science, guys. You're marshalling an airplane. So I know how to do this, but I'm not signed off to do it. So I would never actually do it unless it, there was an emergency and no crew chiefs were around. Um, so, and then they get them to a certain point. The fighter is, is going past them. And so they say, you're clear to, to proceed, like clear to go, go on, give them their salute and usually thumbs up. A lot of the fighter guys, because the airplane is turning around them, they'll reach up and, and touch the aircraft wing. Um, but of course, those big airplane folks, they're like 20, 30 yards in front of the airplane and the airplane's going to turn in front of them. So they're the ones that are, that are going like this with their torch in their hand to turn this way. And then they'll um, turn in front of the crew chief and salute them and be off. Let's see. Um, so flying commercially, those parking spots are much closer together. Plus, they're, they're pulling straight up to a building. Plus, there's baggage train carts. There's food service carts. There's, you know, other, other kinds of vehicles moving around. So that's why when you fly commercially, you don't just have the crew chief in front of them telling them where to stop. Um, and there's, a, there's like a spot marked on the ramp as to where they want that nose wheel of your, of your nose gear to stop. It's underneath the jet. So the pilots can't see when their nose gear is on that spot. So another reason to have that person out front giving them visual aids as to, and like the slower you go, the slower they should be. So you can be going like this and then you start slowing down and the pilot knows to start slowing down and you stop, chalks in. And so they know that they're clear to continue their shutdown. I decided to talk about this as my Air Force story this week because there was a bit of an incident here on base. So big airplanes, crew chief is, you know, quite a ways away. And uh, the A-man, before he got off the Concord, the pilot told him, all right, we've been cleared to go by the tower. We need to button up and go right away. So there was no waiting for the pilot, you know, for the crew chief to be out front and the pilot to say, let's go. So they unplugged the comm cord. A-man crew chief went out front. B-man crew chief is waiting to pull the chalks. And crew chief goes like this and is in the process of going like this. But the co-pilot just saw this and started spinning up the engines to move forward. The aircraft commander, the pilot in this case, um, was looking down at a checklist, making sure they had done everything and, and wasn't paying attention. But he heard the engine start to spool up. And then he sees the A-man crew chief actually doing this. They damn near ran over the B-man crew chief. Now the air crew is insisting that the jet never moved, but they're sitting, you know, 15 feet up in the front of the airplane with the landing gear like 30 feet behind them versus a B-man crew chief who is this close to the tires pulling the chalk. So I would be more inclined to believe the crew chief who was knowing that those tires started moving. So just 
it was an accident. The co-pilot was in a rush. He knew that they were clear to taxi. And he saw this as he was saying chalks out. And he thought the crew chief had already started marshalling him forward. And there you have an accident. Or like almost incident. N nobody was at, nobody was hurt, but it was a close call. One of those things where it wasn't in my husband's squadron, but he heard about it right away because that word spreads and it's like, everybody, you need to increase your SA, your situational awareness, pay attention to what's going on so we don't hurt anybody. So um, in the description below, I forgot to say, so these are all like across the Air Force, across whatever airframe, um, the aids that you use are the same. Now, depending on the crew chief, he might go, be going like this, might be, you know, there's there's ways you can um, make it more your own. But then there's called what's called freestyle marshalling. So usually when you're TDY or sometimes on Fridays, um, we like to have a little fun with what we're doing, right? You've got to have fun with what your job is. So freestyle marshalling. So you will have crew chiefs who will just do the most outlandish things to make their air crew laugh, to make their fellow crew chiefs laugh as they're marshalling out the airplane. So instead of, you know, might say, all right, let's start moving, and then immediately start doing the YMCA as the aircraft starts taxiing by them. Uh, that's just one example. So I will link below some videos so you can see freestyle marshalling. I'll probably also put a regular marshalling so you can see it because, again, I've never done it in real, per in real life. Um, I'm not signed off on the task, so <clears throat> I'm not perfect. I'm just trying to emulate what I've seen um, crew chiefs doing because I've watched a whole lot of airplanes launch. So that is your Air Force story for the day. Go check out the video links below, and everybody have a good stitching week. Bye, guys.